Welcome to the show, folks. This is Wrestling Changed My Life. Here we go. We can endure anything and adapt and pivot and change. Wrestling gave us that ability. I would say nothing in life has impacted me more than the things wrestling has taught me in terms of self-reflection, resilience. Toughness. Some guys have it, some guys don't. Adversity, 100%. How to pick myself up and be a man after I failed. And everything that has shaped my life and where I'm at today would not be there without the values and basically the, the lessons I've learned through the sport of wrestling. For me, wrestling saved my life because it, it allowed me to focus and channel my energy. We're fortunate if you wrestled because if you wrestled, natural talent helps, but it's, it's 5% of the ingredient. It pales in comparison to heart and technique and effort. It humbled me, taught me humility. Nothing can hit, humble you more than wrestling. I think it's the learning to adapt, right? You learn, you learn how to adapt, you learn how to solve problems. You know, if I look back at my time, that's good wrestling. If it gave me one thing more than anything else, it's mental toughness. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast. This is your host, Ryan Warner. My guest today on episode 154 is Josh Torella. He's the assistant coach at the University of Michigan. Go Blue. Go Blue. So he's a Michigan man, three-time All-American back in his competitive days. And folks, if you don't know, the Torella family has 10 All-American honors across three of them. Uh, So Josh's father, the great Mark Torella Sr., Josh's brother Ryan was also a two-time All-American. And so between these three brothers ton of success, and it was awesome to hear from Josh. Fan of the week goes to Johnny G 7613 on Twitter. He's the bearded man, wrestling fan from Southern Virginia. Thank you for the support, my friend. And folks, if you want to support the show, please shop the Wrestling Changed My Life online store. Go to store.wrestlingchangemylife.com. You can find t-shirts, hoodies, sweatshirts, stickers. I say it every time. ton of good shit on there. All proceeds go to support the show store.wrestlingchangemylife.com and let's give it up for Josh Torella. Peace! Josh Torella, thank you for joining the show, my friend. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. Absolutely. So, for the folks who are listening, who listened to the episode with your dad, episode 105, they'll know that you and your brother started wrestling in seventh grade. But one of the things I found interesting was that even before that, you would go to your dad up to Traverse City for the Steve Frazier right. camp, and you would, you know, watch old tapes of him from the seventies. What do you remember about that? You know, before you actually got involved with the sport. Yeah, I think growing up, I don't, you know, I don't. My brothers and I really knew the magnitude of, how, uh, you know, how what my dad's career was, what his accolades were. Um, it was kind of a one time a year thing where we would load up the car and uh, we'd go up to Traverse City and him and Steve Fraser used to have some amazing camps up there. I think they did like two weeks of camp, like four or 500 kids each camp. And it's kind of like the one time a year where we later in my life, um, you know, start out, you know, I did and what he accomplished. And, uh, and I kind of got hooked. My, my brothers are, my oldest brother, five, Ryan, two years older than me. So when they started getting into the sport in middle school, um, you know, I was a little bit younger. So I gravitated pretty for fifth grade. I just met, let me compete. So I was in the you still there? Yeah, I lost you. Okay. I heard, I heard most of that though. And so, so even though there was that, that seventh grade rule that's become so infamous, you were interested a little bit earlier. I understand you guys had a mat in the basement. Would you work out there or would you work out at the school, like in middle school? Uh, both. Yeah, b- well, it was both. You know, I mean, for me, it was, you know, we didn't, we didn't move into the house where we had a mat in the basement until I was in seventh grade. So it was actually convenient for me because it was the, the first year I could start competing. Um, but we, you know, for our middle school season was a six-week season, <laughs> you know, and it was like one of those, it was kind of designed where, you could play every sport um, in, in our school district. So, you know, wrestling, I did that. And then I did a bunch of other sports. My brothers did the same thing. Um, you know, and outside of that season, in the middle school is very limited action as far as competing for me. I went to maybe a few freestyle AAU tournaments, 
um, at the local high schools around town. Um, and that, that was kind of about it until the next season. And so how did it, uh, how did the fire ignite, so to speak? Was it high school? Was it something you saw or some conversation you had with your pops? You know what? I just followed my brothers early on. And then, you know, once I got into middle school, seventh grade, I believe, was the first year my dad took us all to the national tournament. And it kind of became a tradition every year after that. Um, and going to that national tournament, I was completely hooked, watching the guys run out on that stage. And, and my, you know, my dream was sparked and ignited there. Um, and, you know, I started, yeah, I had access. I, I, my dad, he, you know, he finally like, yeah, I got some old tapes you can watch of from the, you know, the 70s. It was pretty, pretty funny looking back now. But so I watched some guys like him and Lee Kemp and some of these, these old timers. Um, and that sparked interest. And then obviously going to the national tournament. Uh, me and my brothers were hooked and, and, um, and then, you know, I started, you know, getting old matches of NC tournaments in the nineties and, and, uh, you know, I'd watch those film, those tapes all the time. And so when did you go from probably the, the summer after your freshman years, from what I hear, the time you went from, you know, you were a state placer, you were a small one Oh three, but really made some big jumps. Well, if you can remember back, what was like the high, the daily routine when you and your brother were, still in high school, you're training in the summer, like getting ready for Fargo. Were you running, working out? or I'm, I'm just curious for some of the parents out there who are wondering what to do with their kids this summer. Yeah, you know, it was kind of, for me, it was like a crossroads uh, from middle school to high school because I was really big into club soccer. So that was like my main sport growing up. And when wrestling kind of took over, I stopped playing club soccer. And in high school, it was like, I, I played high school soccer, but it was all wrestling, you know. And my dad kind of, you know, he laid the roadmap out of, of how, you, you know, you become a successful wrestler. And if you want to put the work in, you know, you're going to find success. If you don't, it's probably a waste of your time. So, you know, he kind of laid that out. Some of that was, you know, some of the workouts he did as far as all the, you know, the pull-ups and the push-ups. And so my brother and I, at a, you know, in high school, we started doing morning workouts. You know, we would, we would work out in the morning. Um, you know, we started, my dad kind of, changed the you know our culture of our high school program he was on staff there so we started doing I think it was like 5 30 or 6 a.m runs um so we would do like run and calisthenics before school started uh, and we did that I'd say three quarters of the season in high school every year um and that was just norm that became that was the norm you know and then you do extra stuff on top of that uh but yeah it was that and then you know after the season you maybe take you know take a few weeks off two three weeks off and then we would, we would get back into training. You know, I was in high school and I was small, like you said, I was 92 pounds my freshman year. Um, so I was still the same size of like a lot of middle school kids. And, and I actually remember like in high school after, after the season was over, we'd have, there'd be like open rooms in, at Clarkson High School, which is a little bit closer to like Davison and Lapeer and stuff. So I remember uh, wrestling with Brent Metcalf and John Reeder um, at a young age, uh, even Trevor Stewart who wrestled at Central Michigan. I mean, I remember banging with those guys all the time in the spring. Um, so we would, we would kind of go, you know, wherever there was good open rooms, we would, we would start working out and, and then, you know, prep for, for uh, Fargo camp. I mean, we would, we'd run all the time. We would do a lot of extra wrestling and drilling in our basement, which made it really convenient. Um, and then obviously the prep for, you know, that if you wrestle the duels and then, and then Fargo. So we were all, all in um, starting high school for sure. And those, you said it, those Michigan uh, teams back then, like the high school teams, that's some of the best uh, the state of Michigan's ever had with you, Metcalf, Donahoe, Reeder, Wynn McKellig. It's like, I didn't realize how stacked the teams were back then. Were, were you? Uh, yeah, Ro Roger, Roger Kish. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was, uh, yeah, Chase Metcalf, Brent Metcalf. I mean, it was, it was loaded, yeah. Was that Donahoe team? Not Donahoe. The Davidson team just feared statewide back then? Or were you guys right up there with them? Yeah, you know what, we were, you know, I'm from Novi, and we were not, that's where Detroit Catholic Central is now, but we were never, um, never really a traditional wrestling school, and uh, it was just kind of one of those things where we had buy-in from all these guys, and guys started developing, and we became a pretty good team. You know, my freshman year, um, we actually, we, I think we lost to Davidson, I'm trying to think, lost to them earlier in the year. And then we, we actually beat them at a dual tournament um, on criteria. Um, 
So, and then they, they ended up beating us, I think, that in the state finals that year. So we made it to, our team made it to the state finals. Uh, and then my sophomore year, we made it to the state semifinals and lost to Davison. Um, so we were, you know, we were, we were relevant. We were pretty tough. But, you know, Davison, they, had, they just had a stacked team, you know. They won it my freshman, sophomore year. Um, you know, and then our program, our, our depth started declining a little bit my junior and senior year. But my first couple of years, yeah, we, we had a pretty good team. And was the legend of Brett Metcalf alive and going at that point, even back yeah. in the early days? I mean, I know you guys were competitors and competed right to the yeah. very end, but, you know, in high school, the, the legend of Brett Metcalf was, was pretty crazy. And, you know, being from Illinois, Poeta was my guy, and they, they scrapped at Fargo one year. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm just wondering, back, back in the early days in Michigan, was, was he the talk of the AAU tournaments and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, everyone, you kind of knew who was, you know, coming up into high school, and, and he was obviously a big name, you know. I mean, he had a lot of success at all the age groups. So, and, you know, and I knew he was because, I, like I said, I was small, so I'd, I'd, I'd roll around with him a lot when he was in middle school. Um, but, yeah, we were always, you know, a couple weeks, especially when I got my, I mean, I got a little bigger my junior and senior year, but we were still a weight class or two apart. Um, but, but we actually trained, you know, I'd say my junior, senior – the summer we train all the time in the summer together. I mean, I'd go up to Davison. He'd come down to my parents' house. Uh, you know, we, he would come, we'd have camps at Michigan. He'd come up and uh, him and I would, you know, we'd, we'd wrestle two, two, three times a day sometimes in the summer. Wow. I didn't know that. So you guys were, mm-hmm. you guys have gone hundreds of times then. Yeah. I wrestled a lot in the practice room. Yeah. And then obviously wow. I was a little, I was a couple years older. So I went off to college and then, he finished off and, and went his college route. Yep. And now when you think about open rooms, you had mentioned that's where you started wrestling some of those guys from Davidson. Another one that you had joined after you were done in college was overtime. And it was, you know, a lot more structured and sophisticated than an open room. But how did you end up getting to Naperville and connecting with Bormet in the first place? So I, I, I knew, who, you know, I knew Sean for quite a few years, not like on a personal level, but just because he was a Michigan alum. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, my oldest brother, I think, was on the year one year when Sean came back and as assistant in 99. Um, so we I, I knew who he was. You know, I actually when I was in high school, I remember wrestling a couple of his guys at Fargo. And and I just like, man, this guy, you know, this bald guy, he's got all these these tough guys. Um, I knew who he was, you know, but it was just kind of later in the, in the college, um, you know, I don't know if it was him reaching out or what, but we, we got connected and, and my, my brother was, you know, he was maybe right after he graduated, but even in college too, I feel like we went down there a few times. Um, but he was a couple, Ryan's a couple years older than me. So when, once he graduated, they started having senior camps and I started going to those and, and really, I mean, overtime was just, he was just ahead of – Sean was kind of ahead of his time a little bit. I mean, he he just had it going on. I mean, he had all the, the toughest kids from the Chicago area and some parts of Indiana come in. You got guy Andrew Howe. I remember wrestling him when he was in high school, and I was training on the senior circuit, you know. So these guys, I mean, they were put in some amazing situations at a young age. Um, and it was just just a phenomenal program they had. And, and I started going down there, yeah, through college. And then after college – you know, he'd have, he'd keep continue senior camps and it'd be like guys like myself and Herbert and Poeta and, and those two actually end up moving down there. And I spent, I started spending more time down there. So I was entertaining the thought of, okay, if these guys move down here, I'm, I'm probably going to have to move down here too. And that's just kind of when the ball started rolling with, uh, you know, Michigan came after Sean and it just kind of happened to where I didn't have to go anywhere and, and he got the job here and, and we kind of built the, uh, kind of reignited the club here once he got here. Well, it's crazy that at the time you were one of the only guys, if not the only guy on the Cliff Keen, you know, wrestling club roster. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm not really sure how the lines are blurred between the RTC and the Cliff Keen, but to me, it's one of the same, but you know, it's really grown and blossomed over, over the years. You, know, you guys are one of the top clubs in the country now on the freestyle scene. Right. Yeah. You know, it was right. You know, when I was in college, it was, you know, it was just, a, it was a, pretty much a few guys afterwards, um, you know, Andy Robat, Olympian, uh, mm-hmm. my, my brother, um, Mike Kozicki trained a little bit. He was on the coaching staff. Um, and then it was, you know, I don't know if Greg Wagner might have trained for a little bit, but it was, it was small. You know, it was, it was definitely much smaller. I mean, my dad started this club in, in the 80s. Um, 
And it was basically designed for that, a platform for college guys to, per, you know, after they graduate to pursue their Olympic and world dreams. And yeah, for whatever reason, it just kind of started, you know, getting smaller and smaller. And, he, you know, Sean was always huge on freestyle and international wrestling. And that was going to be a huge, um, you know, component to him if he came back. And, you know, he, you know, he, I think he built such a good following and he coached a lot of guys on the senior level, even when he was at overtime that guys believed in his system and they, you know, they, they liked being around him where he just had these relationships already built and guys just gravitated and they started coming. You know, at one time, I think, I'm trying to think before 2012 games, it was like myself, Mike Quetta, um, Andrew Howe, you know, Tyrell Todd, he was a year younger than me and he trained, um, you know, after as well. Um, I mean, who else? I mean, you had. Was Jimmy say, Kennedy Jay, in there? Jimmy Kent, yeah. I don't know if Jimmy came before 12. He might have came before 12. Yeah, Jimmy, um, you got Herbert, uh, you know, so it, it was Andrew Howe. I don't know if I mentioned his name, but so it was, it was growing. It, it was definitely growing and it was something, it was like a team, you know, I mean, we had a lot of fun together. Guys trained really hard and, and we built, we built bonds and, and we're still friends to this day. And would you guys all stay at Sean's house or did you get like an overtime apartment where all the wrestlers stayed at? Oh, are you, are you referring to, I was referring to back. Are you referring to Ann Arbor or back in? Well, I knew you were talking about that, but I just I remember that you guys had started at Naperville, so I just jumped back. Oh, but. yeah. So go, yeah, back back pedal. I was already talking about what we had going here. Yeah, what, that was the club we built up here before 2012. But yeah, when Sean, um, when he was at in in Naperville, still, you know, uh, Jim, uh, Mike Poeta and Jake Herbert lived in an apartment together. So I used to stay down there with those guys. Um, and then other guys would kind of just crash there as well. But they 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 moved there. They uprooted. They they lived there. Um, so that's why I was actually apartment hunting a little bit myself. Um, and then this everything just kind of happened and fell into place where I, di I didn't have to go anywhere. Man, that would have been sweet, though. I mean, it's, it's better that it worked out in Michigan because Sean's there now, you're there now, and the resources. But – that would have been a cool thing to see if the senior level like wrestling academy scene would have taken off. Like if you guys would have started a trend yeah. to start doing that, you know, there's, there's no question. There was, it was definitely, it was definitely happening. Um, you know, for how long it would have lasted or how big, I, I don't know, but it was definitely happening. Yeah. Guys, guys were, guys were bought in for sure. When you talk about kind of that connection between, you know, Michigan and the Chicago area, you know, one of your teammates, Eric Tannenbaum, has been on the show and he was a, a legend growing up. What do you remember about the first time meeting Tannenbaum and training with him in college? Yeah. So Eric and I, we hit it off pretty much right away. We were on the same recruiting trip together. You know, our personalities couldn't be probably more different um, and interest and, and just, you know, hobbies and different things like that. But we, I mean, I think the one thing we shared was the drive to be really good. And, and, and we were, we really liked wrestling. Um, and that, that was kind of the common interest. And, and we were, you know, friends off the mat too, but it was, I just, the thing I noticed about, noticed about him was he just, I mean, he could, he could go really hard. Like he could, he could wrestle really hard. Um, and like running, he got the guy ran like a deer I and mean, he could run like six <laughs> miles and he would, he would fly and, and, and everything. I think they, they named him rock because his head was so hard. And every time I'd wrestle him, I'd hit heads, man. It was like hitting a truck. So, Guy was super talented. I mean, he obviously had success at, at all the levels. Um, so we we just we hit it off right away. And I think you know we kind of we were lucky because we had some good mentors and, and older leadership, and my brother and Ryan Bertini and Greg Wagner and some other guys. And and I think the combination of all of us with the same um, same common goal. I think we really we really elevated each other during the time we were here. And were you there when was that the same trip when Mark Perry was there too? Yeah. Yep. Were you there when uh, Tannenbaum and Perry like did freestyle and Greco in the uh, in the front yard? That's some... I might have been. I might have been. Yeah. That's that's um you know those stories like that are yeah <laughs> hard to come by, but that's pretty cool. Right. And, I mean, let alone the fact that you know him and uh you know Perry wrestled several times in college. After that, um, was Steve Luke already at the program as well when you were there? No, Steve Luke's a year younger than us, so. He came on the year after, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, Steve, just another one of those guys. And both of, the, both of those guys were super serious about their academics too, you know. So, I mean, they, I mean, they had aspirations to achieve, you know, high success on the map, but they, they already knew what they were going to do when they came here pretty much. 
I mean, Eric knew he was going to be a doctor from day one. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, I, don't, I knew he was in the sciences. I don't know. You know, I think he was entertaining med school and he ended up being a pharmacist. But those guys were super driven and they were goal oriented and they knew exactly what they were, were coming to Michigan for, for their academics and, and for the, the, the wrestling tradition we had. And, and uh, it, it worked out great. I mean, those guys were awesome teammates and we had a lot of fun together. Yeah, they say he's one of the most competitive people that most people have been around, Steve Luke. Yeah, he's competitive. Yeah, for sure. Stingy, hard to score on. Man, he, you know, he, he's, he's jacked up, but he was super flexible. Just very kind of, you know, you wouldn't think unorthodox, but he had some tendencies where it was just really hard to score on him. I mean, you could go – I remember him and Gavin had a match, I think, in Vegas where Steve had like eight blood times – and the match went forever. And I think it was like an, it was overtime, I think. But I mean, they, they, I mean, both of them have unique styles and they, they had a really hard time scoring at each other until overtime. I mean, that's just, I'm thinking back to how deep those teams were. I mean, the one year you guys got second, I don't know if Steve was on that team or not, but. Uh, he was red shirt. He red shirted that year as his freshman year. Okay. And you mentioned that you have you know, a different approach personality than Tannenbaum which I, I maybe wouldn't have guessed that how would you say you guys are, are different or, or what was your like demeanor in college if you know if you can think back to those times yeah but, well I mean not, I mean I mean not a whole lot different just like you know we're just like he was like so into you know becoming a doctor and ingrained in, into that into his studies with that and you know I didn't quite know what I wanted to major in you know uh just personalities I mean he would like DJ on the side <laughs> you know and, and do stuff like that you know to make money and uh just you know we just I mean we had our I can't really explain it just yeah personalities were different but we were really close and really good friends yeah now it seems like everyone was really close on those on those teams did you work out with Ryan a lot when he was still on the team when you were in college yeah yeah so we I mean for, especially for the first few years I, I mean we were we would drill we were drill partners almost every day um, you know, him and I would get up in the morning and run together. And it was a, a guy that would, we would kind of keep each other accountable, you know, and I think we were lucky to have that, you know, we lived with each other every year. Um, you know, it's always easier to live with, with family. You can kind of yell at them when they're slacking, you know? So we, I mean, we, we, I mean, we have always been really close. Our family has always been, you know, both my brothers, we, we've always been super close and, 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 uh, kind of a support system for one another. So him and him and, myself I mean it was it was I mean we just did most everything together we push each other every day a lot of extra workouts um you know even up to the point where he stopped competing at the senior level he would still come to like some tournaments he came to Cuba one time he would come to training camps and put his body through uh some some brutal workouts just to just to help support me and, and try to put me in the best situation possible and I had heard that you guys you know as you said drilled a lot but by the time he was a senior, he was pretty big, and you were 141, right. and so you didn't necessarily wrestle as much, but mm -mm. rumor has it you guys wrestled in a match that was refereed one time. That's right. What, what yeah. happened here? So that was probably until my senior level career where my, my brother stopped competing. I think I might have beat him a couple of times there, but I, I, you know, that he would always big brother me. So it was like, you know, every time I'd be close to scoring or something, you know, he'd counter it and get on top of me and start, start wrenching me. You know, he was really good on top. So uh you know he wasn't feeling that great you know my brother he cut a decent amount of weight to 149 his his retro sophomore year um and I was like you know I was competing whatever every I don't know once a month of these open tournaments you know and I I was started at 33 and then I went up to 41 so I was I was feeling good at practice every day you know and he this was later in the week and we were kind of bickering and going back and forth before practice and then I don't know who challenged too but I'm like let's wrestle right now. I'll beat you, you know? And we start, I don't know if it was who refed it. One of the college guys, Tannenbaum or someone, but well, that was the, the closest I've ever come to beating my brother in college. I got lost in double overtime. Man. Was there takedowns a good scoring or was it a tight one? Oh, uh, there was no, there, yeah, there was, there was takedowns. I mean, it was, it was, I, I want to say it was like a 10, eight match, something crazy like that, you know? And it, it was, it, it, I don't know if it was, overtime or double overtime it, he might have he might have rode me out he might have rode me out which isn't surprising i mean it's pretty tough the Torella's on top i mean not to focus on tandem the whole time but he said his senior year your dad came back and was on the staff and it really helped him get ready for perry i mean thinking back to when you first got involved with wrestling with your dad 
how like what was the first thing he showed you was he the guy like teaching you or did he let someone else teach you guys how did all how did that get started no he pretty much yeah he pretty much taught us all the fundamentals you know you know just kind of everything from kind of from square one but we you know the thing is we didn't wrestle till seventh grade but like in the in the basement me and my brother we would like just gravitate t- towards it you know like rough housing but you know, we'd find old headgears that my dad had, or like singlets and different stuff. We'd put these things on. And so we were like, we'd go at it. And I think we had like a natural feel for it anyway. Um, you know, but really, yeah, he it was kind of like that roadmap. Like he, he basically said, like, if you're all in, he's like, I'm all in with you guys, you know, and we definitely were, but it, it wasn't like a, he taught us what we, you know, when, when we were working out and doing different things, but like extra workouts, he was never that guy saying, you need to do this. You need to do that. If you want to be good, you need to do this. You know, he pretty much told us what the stuff he did. And, you know, I think watching the national tournament and seeing the, you know, just the scale of, of athletes and you could tell they had to put themselves through a lot of suffering. And uh, I think we just kind of gravitated towards doing the extra stuff. But as far as the fundamentals, and the skill sets that that all came from my dad, you know. It was he he has a whole system on top, and and we kind of what we did. We I mean we we would we'd have a progression drill what we would do almost every day, and it wasn't like we were doing a bunch of fancy stuff. We would do the same stuff over and over and over again. On our feet, we had a we had a few setups from single leg, high and low. We'd have maybe one setup from high crotch and double fireman's carry. Um, we would do leg defense after that. We would do bottom work, and then we'd do top progression. So we pretty much run through that every day. We would we would drill that. And when you say top progression, what does that look like? Well, it you know uh, pressure on top, you know uh, breakdown to uh, set up with the leg in. A lot of stuff came from leg in. Um, you know, obviously we'd work on some other stuff too, like you know cradle from other positions and stuff. But a lot of our stuff primarily came from high leg position and cross body position. And really, that was just the fundamentals that our dad taught us and the drilling that we did over and over and over again. I mean, and outside of the technique, you think about someone of like character and discipline, you know, your dad is someone that comes to mind for a lot of people. And in fact, you know, again, a number of people have come on the show have said that your dad's like one of the most disciplined people they've ever met. What do you remember from him, like running, uh, running your family business, but also, you know, raising a family? Was he someone who was like a 5 a.m. or up every day? I mean, what was yeah. his like kind of work ethic and drive? Yeah. So yeah, growing up, you know, at a young age, you know, I, my, my dad was kind of like, he was obviously, you know, you had him on the show, but he was coaching in Las Vegas for five years. He came back to Michigan, just getting his feet in the door in the insurance business. And on the, on the side, he was a volunteer coach at Michigan for two years, mm-hmm. I think till I was like, maybe one and a half or two, you know, he stopped. And then, uh, so really growing up, he had a, a, a long separation with like being around wrestling in any aspect. He was so driven to be the best he could be at what he was doing, uh, which was, you know, in the insurance services um, that, I mean, I just remember my dad, I could tell he was working extremely hard because there'd be some long days. And I remember him coming home, didn't eat breakfast or lunch. He'd come home with eyes this big. And he, you know, and he'd be pounding the food and I could just tell, I mean, he was, he was grinding, you know, and he, he'd get up at five, 6 AM and he'd run three, four miles every day. And he did 200 pushups every morning. I know that. So I remember when I was younger, I'd be on his back and be doing the pushups. And so I remember oh, that was his routine. Him and my mom would actually wake up every morning and my mom would get us situated and, and then they would both, they'd, they'd go hit the pavement and run and come back. And then we'd go to school and my dad go to work. And that was kind of the norm for a long time, you know, so that's, that's kind of what I remembered, I, you know, the, really the wrestling, like I said, until we got later involved, like my brothers in middle school, the only, the only time we were, we were really around it was that, that camp him and, and Steve Frazier did. I mean, God, think about that. That's what you're seeing every day. So that's just ingrained in your, in your mind that that's, you know, a routine that you could aspire to do. I mean, in the 200 pushups, he was doing that even when he was a dad, like as an adult, like way away from oh, yeah. wrestling? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And he ran for years and he'll tell you he was the worst runner. And he didn't run a lot. He ran like three, four miles. My mom ran, she ran like three, I think three marathons, but my dad, yeah, he, and even still to this day, I mean, he modified it, you know, what he's doing, but he works out every day. He might, he might take one or two days off. He, he, he's big into the road biking now. It's like, you know, less, less stress on his joints and stuff. So he'll, in the summertime, he'll run 
or he'll do a, one, a road bike once a week for at least like a 40 mile ride, maybe 40 or 50 mile ride. He does that once a week usually. And then sometimes he'll do a mountain bike and then he does like, he'll do some different, you know, circuit training and stuff like that. He's an animal. Um, I saw that just a couple weeks or months ago, you went out for like a normal run, like a five, six mile run. Next thing you know, you're running a marathon. What the hell happened there? Yeah. Um, well, I don't really know what happened. It's just something that my brain told me to keep going. But I mean, uh, did your wife call and say, hey, it's been four hours. Where the hell have you been here? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't like, hey, it's been four hours. Like, are you okay, honey? No, it was like, get your butt back here because it's a nice day and the kids have been outside in the, the water house, the bounce house and stuff, and you, you're supposed to be here. Um, I don't know. I just – I started this quarantine. I, I, I used to run a little bit here and there, nothing crazy. I'm more, I've always been more like a weightlifting guy. but. I just started, I, you know, I didn't have as much access to the weights. I had like some dumbbells and so I was still doing that, but I just started running like three, four days a week, like three, four miles at a time. And then I just started increasing and, and, and there's so many trails in Ann Arbor that you don't even know about. I've been here almost what 20 years and I didn't, there's like all these trails I've never even in, been into. So I, I was started running these trails. So I started running like five miles, six miles, eight miles, 10 miles. And then, and then I did a half marathon and then I did the next week, I did another half marathon. I think the week after that I did 15 miles. So it wasn't like I wasn't running. I started running quite a bit, mm -hmm. but the thought in the back, in the back of my head was like, I was like, man, I always wanted to do a marathon. I just, just the bucket list thing. I just want to do one, you know? So that day I went for the run, I was kind of going on a, a route that I created around some of these trails and around the Huron river. And, you know, that would have probably been like a seven to 10 mile run that I was going to, going to do and kind of veered away and, uh, kind of went away from Ann Arbor on a, on a road that's, you know, not, not really populated. Um, so I, I'm probably like seven and a half in, I know like, okay, if I turn around, it's still going to be over 15 miles. You know, I'm just going to keep going a little more. And I just kind of got in a zone and just kept going and felt pretty good up until about mile 19. And then I, I hit a wall, <laughs> but <clears throat> Do you, when you're running now, or even back when you were in college running, are you a big visualizer? I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I used to get on the treadmill in the mornings in college all the time. And I would, I would visualize hundreds of matches of how I was going to win a national title, you know, in, in different ways I would do it. You know, I'd, I'd have, I remember in my mind, like, okay, I'm in the semifinals and just throwing some adversity in your mind, like, I'm down, I'm down four. How am I, how am I coming back from this? And you, you visualize yourself doing it. And then you get to the finals. Like I would kind of run through tournaments in my head, actually. Um, and a lot of that went through when I was doing cardio and then the cardio just flew by and you're mm -hmm. like, Whoa, I'm already done, you know, and I'm, I just got to the semis, you know? And so now that you're a coach, what are you visualizing now? Like signing a big recruit, working with your guys. How, how does that change for you? Yeah. I mean, it, it definitely changes, but, I, you know, I, it, but I still kind of, there's times where like, I'll still go on a run and I'll visualize how, you know, how we're getting all these guys into the finals or how we getting all these guys in the podium. And I'll actually run through some matches in my head with like Mason Paris and some of these other guys. It's kind of, <laughs> kind of, kind of sounds crazy, you know, but I'll kind of run through that in my head. Like he can do this, he can do that. He might, you know, uh, so I'll visualize a little bit, uh, about our team. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think it definitely changes. The competitor coach component changes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's just kind of one of those things where wrestling becomes so ingrained in your life that it's kind of hard to flip that switch off, even during this quarantine. I mean, you're you're always thinking about that. Like you said, you're thinking about the big recruits that you want to land. You're thinking about your development of your team and, and what these guys are doing when you're not with them. And all these different things are always going through your mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't even imagine how much – yeah, the, the quarantine has thrown a wrench into, into things because a lot of coaches have told me that the off season, sometimes their busiest time of the year with the camps and the recruiting. And then you have freestyle, um, both high school recruiting and then the, the Cliff mm -hmm. Keen stuff. Um, like before the quarantine started, what would a typical day be like in the off season for you? Like if this was business as usual? I mean, it, it would, it would be kind of routine, it, you know, out of the season, you know, some guys, it, it never kind of ends because, you know, there'll be a chunk of guys that will take a little time off the mat and they'll hit the weights hard and do cross training. Then we'll have guys that jump right into 
the freestyle circuit, you know, this year was a little different because the, obviously the, the trials were pretty close after the uh, the uh, NC tournament would have been. But we had guys like Mason and other guys they were qualified and they would have been wrestling, you know. So for us, it would have been, you know, you know, right after the right after the uh, the tournament, maybe take a few days where I'm not going in as early, but we have RTC practice and you're going to be there. I'm not going to miss RTC practice. So I would have probably after a few days, it would have been kind of like back to somewhat of a grind. I mean, you're still recruiting a lot, you know, so a lot of these kids were spacing out their visits. So you're, you're timing kids to come in on unofficials and officials um, right after the season. So you're kind of balancing that uh, uh, the recruiting piece, you're balancing um, the senior level stuff. You know, we, we usually have an eight week RTC program, uh, that's like a high school RTC program that starts up pretty fast too. Um, so, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're kind of going, like you said, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't slow down a whole lot, you know, cause you, you got all the, you know, I, I, if it's not Olympic year, you got the, the U S open and, and the junior age, you got universities, you know, you're recruiting. Um, we have a different component, obviously with foreign athletes, uh, guys that represent other countries. So there is a lot of uh, delegating that goes on and, and the time management's a big piece, but, um, but yeah, it's, it, it becomes fun though, because it's, it, it's a little different than the college season, right? It's not the same college grind that, you know, it's, it's, you, it's different, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just as time consuming, I would say, but it's refreshing because it's, it's just a little different. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy how much of the time you're focused on freestyle as a coach, you know, in comparison with folk style. Yeah. It's a lot. Right. What yeah. have you picked up, um, from working with Sergey over the past two years? Yeah, I mean, Sergey's been an unbelievable addition to our, our club. I mean, he's – I mean, not only, obviously, you look at his accolades and you're like, geez, I mean, you watch his matches. The guy was a complete <laughs> complete animal, you know. I mean, he was pound for pound one of the best ever to ever do it, you know. So, I mean, just that alone, I mean, I mean, his, you got to have so much respect for the guy. But until you actually meet him, I mean, there's a lot of people that could be good at something, but they might not be the greatest people or – you know, you don't, you just don't know what they actually are like in person. Mm-hmm. He is so, he's so real and genuine and, uh, and like, he's actually a, a really kind person. Um, he's got a big heart. And I think like that makes it, the respect even that much greater for the guy. And, and he couldn't fit into a better program than ours, as far as like just our personalities and the way that we operate. And I, he's just been, he, he's been awesome. So I, I've learned a lot on that side of it, but also obviously the technique side is, has been really cool. Um, you know, I've been like a sponge, like our athletes too. And, and I'm in there, you know, sometimes when he, when he's running the practices and, and I'm just watching all of his nuances and, and the way he breaks down technique and, and kind of what his progression of, of skill sets are. Um, and so I've taken, I, I know our whole staff's taken a lot, a lot away from Sergey. And what, what is he doing technically? It's a little bit different from the system you were raised in between your yeah. dad and, and Bormat. Yeah. You know, you know, I mean, a lot of you know, a lot of people in the U.S. did grow up, you know, with a more of a you know background in throws and throws and different and different holds like that. I didn't as much. Um, so for me, it was you know a lot of a lot of like over under position, uh, a lot of two on one position. I know, and there's people that are good two on one, but like his the way he sets up his fireman's off a two on one or his step around throw. Um, those positions, I mean, he, he's, he's just the best in the world at. I mean, that's where he made his living. If you go back and watch his films, I mean, he would almost hit that step around throw in every match, mm-hmm. you know. But just little tricks, even from, like, single leg defense. And he's got all these little tricks that um, they're just, yeah, stuff I haven't seen before. And, uh, and, and I've, I've learned a lot, you know, as a coach from, it- from watching him. As you're saying that, I'm thinking about the situation you guys have at Michigan, one of the top public schools in the country, you know, standalone facility, incredibly funded program, awesome staff. Then you got Sergey, like, man, what a situation for a kid to be training in right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an incredible time. I mean, obviously with the circumstances everyone's dealing with is everyone's dealing with a little adversity right now, uh, but as far as what our, what we built our program up and, and what our vision is, I think it's, I think it's kind of coming to fruition and uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of great things ahead, I think for our program, Um, you know, just with continuing to, you know, to absorb RTC guys, uh, our guys, and maybe some guys that aren't aren't from, from Michigan. Um, I think we've done, you know, we're starting to do a better job with that and, and, 
you know, you're seeing guys like Derringer here training and it's, uh, yeah, like you said, I mean, we have, we have a pretty good balance right now. I mean, as far as our academics, I mean, that's what we're looking for. I mean, if a kid that's pretty serious about his academics, wants to wrestle in the big 10, be a part of a great freestyle program. I mean, we have, we kind of check all those boxes. And is it unique that you have two guys who are Olympians, uh, and Michik and Amin for, for other countries. Does that change how they approach things? Like, do they have to go to those native countries to train at a certain time of the year? Or, like, how has that been unique to you, to the build-up? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's been, definitely been unique. I mean, their federations have been pretty easy to work with, you know. And, you know, you know, Kellen Russell and Sean, they do a lot of, like, the hands-on stuff with their federations. Um, mm-hmm. But we're all invested into – the freestyle though. I mean, it will, we'll, you know, we'll go to the events and travel and, and, and support those guys. But um, yeah, so there, I mean, sometimes there's challenges with depending on, you know, federations, but it's, you know, it's, you just got to get on the same page and, and, uh, but those guys, I mean, they've been great. I mean, they, they don't have to go there and, and, and train a whole lot. You know, I know the, you know, the, the means they'll go there, you know, a couple of times, maybe a year and, and uh, you know, step on maybe a little more too. He's got, he's got a quite a bit of family over, over there. So, um, you know, after events, I know they, sometimes they both go over there and I think their government people like to meet them and, and the president of the, the wrestling federation spent some time with them and, and go over different things. And, but other than that, they're, they're primarily here training most of the time. He's like a, like a King over there. If not, he will be soon, man. They love him. Yeah. Over he, there. Yeah. He definitely can be. He definitely can be. Yeah. Well, he's, uh, yeah, I mean, outside of a handful of athletes, I mean, he, I mean, he could be one of the, you know, the more successful ones. Yeah. It's exciting, man. And, you know, I think I was telling someone, I can't think of another college team where they've had two current Olympians on one team, which is what you guys are going to have next year. So, you know, looking forward and just kind of moving into the next season, we'll just we'll close down with this. You know, what, what excites you about getting up every day and coaching? I mean, obviously you could have gone the business route. You decided to go into coaching. You know, I guess, what do you love about it? I, I just, I love the, like the competing aspect, the fire that you have to bring every day to be your best. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of joy in watching guys develop and succeed and, and having success. I mean, there's a lot of joy in that. So, and then I got a lot of passion for this place, you know, I've experienced it as a student athlete, you know, and now as a coach and, and that's kind of unique as myself, Kellen Russell and Sean Bourne Matter all have been in that same position. So, I, you know, it's, we, I think we enjoy working together. I think that makes it fun and, and, uh, and motivating to get up every day and give your best for people that are, are doing the same thing and working equally as hard with the same vision. Um, so, you know, that's the, the coaching aspect, man. It's, it's the, the competing, the fire, being around young, young guys that are ambitious. Um, I mean, that's fun. That keeps you young, you know, I mean, I, I try to work out and wrestle these guys as much as I possibly can. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and, uh, and like I said, it's just, it's, it's, it's building something, right? Like you're, you, whatever you do, like what I was taught growing up, you, you always try to be the best at, mm-hmm. you know, I think my grandpa laid that foundation down. It's like, you don't take anything for granted. Nothing's given to you. You have to earn everything you have. And, and that's kind of the approach I think our staff has. And that's the kind of guys we're trying to bring in is guys that are, are willing to put the boots on every day and go to work. Love it. Go blue, baby. Go blue. Go blue. Go blue. Thank you again for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Ryan. You got it. Thanks. And all great things must come to an end. If you want to hear more from the podcast, text WRESTLE to 555-888. That's WRESTLE to 555-888. You can also find us on Instagram, Wrestling Changed My Life, Twitter, Ryan underscore N underscore Warner, as well as our website, WrestlingChangedMyLife.com. Take care, y'all. Calm. Take care, y'all. Calm. Take care, y'all. Calm. Take care, y'all. Calm. Take care, y'all.